And actually, the leap of faith, to give it the memorable name that Søren Kierkegaard bestowed upon it, is an imposture. As he himself pointed out, it is not a leap that can be made once and for all. It is a leap that has to go on and on being performed in spite of mounting evidence to the contrary. This effort is actually too much for the human mind and leads to delusions and manias. Religion understands perfectly well that the leap is subject to sharply diminishing returns, which is why it often doesn't in fact rely on faith at all, but instead corrupts faith and insults reason. You are listening to A Leap of Doubt, the podcast that celebrates science, secular humanism, and the courage it takes to embrace an evidence-based life of doubt and questioning. Hello and welcome to the very first installment of A Leap of Doubt, a new podcast hosted by myself, Nathan Dickey, episode number 001. And yes, I'm doing the three-digit notation thing because I'm feeling ambitious about one day being up to number 100 and beyond. <laughs> uh, I'm in this for the long haul because I feel I have a lot of interesting ideas I want to share with someone besides myself and many interesting people I want to speak with who know how to talk better than me. And this podcast is about uh, all sorts of things, secular humanism, philosophy, science, history, politics, um, atheism, feminism, social justice, pop culture, and also the sort of personal stories of raw human experience that make trained journalists like myself all tingly inside. Uh, my friend Emily, who I know through Facebook, wrote something in a comment on one of my posts that I really relate to. She wrote, everything is interesting to me. That's kind of stressful sometimes because I feel like a cat and the world is a room full of shiny toys. Uh, in short, this is a podcast about all the shiny toys. Well, a lot of them anyway. And for this debut episode, we are talking about a uh, philosophy of religion philosophy, religion, and the philosophy of religion, I should say, because apparently I don't know how to start small and work my way up to big and profound <laughs> subjects. Uh, fortunately for me, I'm not alone on this first episode. I have been fortunate enough to acquire two willing victims to interview, uh, Justin Schieber and Benjamin Watkins, the two hosts of Real Atheology, a Philosophy of Religion podcast. Uh, welcome, Justin and Ben, and thank you for putting your reputations on the line by coming on my show. <laughs> Thanks for, having, <laughs> Thanks for having us. So I have uh, just mentioned the podcast the two of you host. Uh, let's start with that, as most of these things start out. Uh, tell us about your show, what you hope to accomplish with it, and the Justin and Ben bromance origin story. <laughs> yeah, well... Um, I guess in, in a similar way, uh, Ben and I uh, have found our shiny toys in the topic of philosophy of religion. And well, I did a I was with a podcast a few years back called The Reasonable Doubts. And once that kind of ended, I still had a lot more uh, philosophical interests that I wanted to, to kind of continue to mull over, um, mainly in, in regards to philosophy of religion. And so I uh, started up a new show called Real Atheology, and I started off with YouTube stuff, but after a while, that format just doesn't really yield itself well to uh, the kind of discussions I want to have. We went to Reason Rally, uh, I think it was in June of last year, or maybe the year before, I'm forgetting. It's the year before, I think <laughs> okay. 2000. 16 years. Yeah, and we met there mostly as strangers. I mean, we knew each other through, through Facebook, but uh, we ended up um, largely ignoring the, the rallying reason and just walking around the streets of D.C. drunk at three in the morning and uh, <laughs> realized we had a lot of <laughs> shared interests. And um, so when I eventually switched to podcast format, uh, Ben uh, continuously popped up as the obvious choice for a co-host. We even won money at the Reason Rally. For oh my God, yeah, tell that story. <laughs> it was the last day of the Reason Rally. We were just walking. We were just kind of leaving the Capitol area, the lawn. And we, we had just been stopping and talking to people along the way. And we were stopped by a bunch of uh, Frank Turret-style apologists. And they started asking us questions about our knowledge of the Bible. And it was like, you know, hey, if you get them right... You know, um, we'll give you forty dollars, and so of course there was some kind of brain teasers and stuff. I thought it was fifty. 
It's fifty. Uh, it's forty or fifty. I can't remember. Okay. Um, it didn't matter because we ended up spending it on uh, beer. I think. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I mean, we just rattled off. Is that, what was it? The Ten Commandments. They were like, "Can you name X amount of Ten Commandments?" And yeah, like, and then boom, 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 boom. our first question was, of course, was uh, which version of the Ten Commandments uh, they were after, because there are a couple different variations of these. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Was it was it before was it the set that Moses accidentally broke on the on Mount, on Mount Sinai or was it the the latter ones that he had to re etch? Um, but yeah, we ended up getting them all, and <laughs> they were nice people. We had a great conversation, and we walked away with uh, some some good old alcohol money for that night. Oh, well, that's awesome! Good for them for being like a confident that I guess uh, they know a lot and maybe. Uh, surprising them with your well, it's knowledge. An apologetic technique. So it's a way of if you you can you know if you, obviously if you're flashing money around, you can get people to come in and get interested. And so then what they do is, you know, witness the Holy Spirit and try to convert people. This is how they you know go about doing it. And then of course they didn't realize that they had you know stumbled across two philosophically inclined. And Fingers. and somewhat biblic <laughs> somewhat biblically literate. <laughs> <laughs> and so by the end of it we were, you know, recommending different things for them to read on the theist side. And they kind of looked at each other and they were like, An atheist is recommending me, you know, apologetics theistic literature. And so it was mm-hmm. a interesting conversation to say the least. Yeah, sounds like it. Well, I have a lot more respect for that kind of approach than the one I've uh, encountered, um, which is uh, just walking down the street and seeing a hundred dollar bill on the ground and picking it up and realizing that it's actually a tract, a religious tract. <laughs> <laughs> um, I what I haven't seen in several years is remember those like you find them in like bathrooms and stuff, and they were like little index card sized things like "You're going to hell." <laughs> and you like you open it up, and there'd be a, a whole you know story about how you're going to hell if you don't accept Jesus. Uh, chick tracks, right? I think that's what they were called. Yeah, I, I, like, I find those in my local coffee shop, and I'm always pleased. <laughs> I uh, I have a something of a little hobby or pastime in collecting those. So I've, I've yeah, got like a, I've collected a, little, a few. Of the, I, I haven't seen one in in quite some time now. Yeah, um, they uh, pop up every summer here in my town, all over the place. So. Uh, well, we're, uh, we're talking about, uh, philosophy of religion. So I've got my kids table all set up and we've got, <laughs> we've got crayons, coloring books, glitter, and all the things that are good. Uh, so for our listeners who may not be familiar with this, what is philosophy of religion and what kinds of questions does it concern itself with? And, uh, either one or both of you can go ahead with that one. All right. <clears throat> so philosophy of religion. Uh, you, you know, you always have philosophy of language, philosophy of mind. All it is is you're thinking about some particular subject uh, from a philosophical perspective. So you're asking all these interesting questions, trying to get clear on the the, the kind of conceptual landscape involved in that particular uh, set of questions. And so philosophy of religion is just like that. You're taking religious concepts, you're thinking about them philosophically, you are perhaps trying to get to the truth of some of the more interesting claims, like whether or not there is a God, whether or not life has meaning. Um, and what's what I like about philosophy of religion in particular is that it connects us in so many, so many ways to so many of the greatest, deepest questions of what it is to be human. So this touches you on the issue of morality, right? Like, is moral realism true? What does it mean to say that we have an obligation to help the poor or to, you know, do, you know, to not murder, right? Like these kind of more more foundational moral questions. What do those questions actually mean? Um, and, you know, does a God exist? You can go through all the arguments there, all the scientific or the philosophical arguments. And just generally, it's just thinking about religious concepts not in a kind of um, devotional Bible study way or in a kind of um, purely scientific way, but no, you're thinking about these philosophically. You're really trying to parse the distinctions, find the appropriate questions, and trying to bring to bear philosophical methodology to those most important questions. 
yeah, it connects us with uh, those big questions. And uh, the reason philosophy of religion appeals to me personally uh, is because it also connects me with uh, my past beliefs in a big way. Yes, uh, because absolutely. I, because I came out of uh, religion. I actually was training to be a professional apologist in my late teens and planning to go into uh, professional apologetics as a career and uh, ended up going atheist pretty soon thereafter uh, as a result of thinking about these deep questions. So uh, engaging with believers on those same questions from my position and worldview now really connects me with the way I used to think and continues to be a way of challenging myself and keeping myself in check. Absolutely. Okay. Um, as both of you are probably all too aware, um, my kids' table reference refers to a statement made by a philosophy professor named Peter Bogosian, who uh, teaches at Portland State University. And I think most everybody agrees that Bogosian is like uh, the greatest philosopher of the modern age. Uh, I think most agree he's like the best or something. Right. Uh, so there's two Bogosians. There's a Peter Bogosian and a Paul Bogosian, right? <laughs> yeah. So so Peter Bogosian he wrote this book um, called uh, Manual for Creating Atheists, mm -hmm. um, and it's been a very controversial book among well among both people of the theistic perspective and atheistic perspective. Um, I disagree with most of what is in that book, even as someone who ultimately agrees with his metaphysical views um is he at least a street epistemologist yes yeah. yeah okay now that that said um i do generally speaking like the notion of just treating conversations in a kind of socratic way um but i also think that that means you need to avoid entering those conversations with a kind of pretense i think that what needs to be done is those need those conversations need to be entered into not as a kind of patient versus doctor mentality of of disabusing these poor people of their their you know their very confused religious mental illness right like um mm -hmm. rather it needs to be a conversation in which you both mutually explore the uh ideas and the bases behind the beliefs that you have and from what i've from what, what what little I've read, um, I, I do not agree with the general approach of him. Um, and he also, he's, he said some uh, rather incendiary things about philosophy of religion as a field in general, as a field yeah, being taught at universities. Well. <laughs> yeah. So, so he, he, he kind of flippantly commented about how uh, this is a kid's table conversation, this philosophy of religion stuff, right? So, yeah. We're we're sitting here having this nice little conversation around a kid's table with our glitter and our uh our glue sticks and I'm eating play doh. <laughs> and uh I will add to that that it's not his attitude is not surprising. That he, even though we would not endorse that sort of approach to philosophy of religion, a lot of philosophy of religion, contemporary philosophy of religion at least, is dominated by Western traditions and Christian theism. Mm -hmm. And the vast majority of professional philosophers these days are non-theists. They're either atheists or agnostic. And so they've rejected that model. So they just don't, they, they just don't interact with the philosophy of religion. They just see it as something that's, look, it's heading in directions that I've rejected. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not surprising that there's people, you know, like him, that, you know, with all the moral atrocities um, that you'll see come with religion or the lax epistemic um, rigor to a lot of uh, religious belief that you see in lay people, um, that attitude's just not surprising. At least from my perspective, if you, if you step back and look at, you know, what the terrain looks like, it's not surprising that you find people like that. And it's it's also not as surprising when you look at the subgroup of philosophers who do interact with philosophy of religion that most of them are theists actually, and most of those theists are Christians, as as you mentioned, uh, Ben. Um, so the question there is: Okay, is this because <laughs> is this because theism in general and Christian theism in particular have particular philosophical 
merits to them? Or is this merely a product of the fact that, you know, much of Western philosophy is 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 and has been steeped in um, a kind of Christian uh, framework for much of its mm. its existence. Um, and so that kind of question is itself a question that's worthy of exploration within philosophy of religion. Um, I'm skeptical that it has to do with the merits of Christianity. Um, I'm a person who very much enjoys philosophy of religion, and I've come, a, I've of course come away with those. Uh, from those studies with a, a view very much on the opposite. Um, I do not think Christianity is true, nor do I think that theism more generally is true. That said, uh, that interesting demographic fact is something to, uh, to think about. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so that's why you would probably say this uh, dismissive attitude toward philosophy of religion is so common among people in the atheist movement. And that's by and large the reason uh, why this attitude exists for the most part. Uh, well, now, in as far as lay people go, that attitude towards it, um, you know, where it's a uh, very science oriented group of people. So, mm -hmm. um, generally, when you go to atheist events or join atheist groups, there's a huge emphasis on, on, on science. And well, a lot of philosophy of religion just isn't science. It's just, mm -hmm. it's just a different methodology. And so I think a lot of people, lay people just dismiss it on that end. You know, like, look, science goes and finds the deepest truths about reality and does so without the need for God. So just whoosh, toss them out. I, I think that explains a lot of that attitude. There, there is an assumption w working in the background here, uh, a kind of, um, what would you call it? A, a kind of confrontational thesis that like, that science in its most fundamental sense is in direct opposition to any kind of, any kind of religious claim, I guess. With that assumption and the, the already mentioned fact that much of the modern secular movement is very science oriented, um, then it kind of, you end up with the conclusion, well, then, you know, philosophy of religion isn't something to take particularly seriously because um, science is good. And if it's if it's diametrically Faith opposed to any religious notion, then, you know, that's not something that needs to be considered in any real in any real depth. Um, now, I think that 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 the uh, the confrontational thesis there, the science versus religion thing, I think is a is a really <laughs> complicated subject and there's literally like probably 20 different ways you could interpret the notion of the science being at war with religion mm -hmm. um and so i think that 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 issue in particular is is mostly a useless thing to say so when someone says that like religion is at war with science or science is at war with religion i i'm like well okay but let's talk about like what exactly you mean by that right um if it's about the methodologies, I'm far more likely to lend you my ear in that respect. Um, and there are some valid criticisms there. But um, as a general thesis, I, I'm, I'm very allergic to those notions. But I think another, another reason, I think if we're, if we're to identify some of the reasons with which people, or I, I guess some of the reasons why people are so, tend to be, very dismissive of philosophy of religion. I would say a big part of that is because of the nature of the questions that are being discussed. Um, they're hyper-partisan, and they always have been. These ideas, these beliefs are core to our identities as individuals. And when someone questions uh, a particular belief of ours, it's human nature to be, to kind of revolt and to either... Um, you know, to, to, to hold on to those beliefs even stronger, right? So mm -hmm. we're not exactly rational when we're discussing those things that are core to our identity. And so no one should be surprised that the religious versus atheism discussion needs to be put in terms of verses rather than an exploration. It, it always has to be a war. And that's always, that's, that's human nature. And I guess part of our show, what I would like to see from it is a, a more fair minded and, uh, open approach to these questions. I guess taking seriously religious claims and really kind of hearing them on their merits and wondering if 
you know, perhaps people haven't taken these things as seriously as they should have. Or, for our religious listeners, doing the exact same thing for the arguments on the other side. Um, and so we hope to attract a, uh, listeners on both sides of those questions. And one of the things that I want to bring to the table in the show, first off, I agree with everything that Jesse just said. But, of course you do. <laughs> <laughs> but um, one of the things that interests me is, okay, once we denied the existence of God, we no longer believe in the existence of a personal disembodied mind who takes an interest in our lives, where do we go from religion there? What happens to spirituality? What can we salvage from these religious traditions? Because there's obviously some good things about them. There's clearly some bad things that we need to discard. But so what's the religion of the future going to look like? Religion's a pretty um new thing on the scene and that it's only been around for maybe fifty, sixty thousand years. Um and it's changed radically in that time. So we have no reason to expect that religions of a hundred or a thousand or, you know, even if, if we can get there, you know, a million years from now, they're not going to look anything like they do now. And so what what direction do we go in after that? And so I think those are questions that get lost by people who just dismiss the philosophy of religion as it's not science, it's not worth exploring. I think you miss that entire discussion, um, that, tire, that entire area of exploration to explore non-theistic traditions like Taoism or Buddhism or pantheism or even for, um, I've advocated that Stoicism of, you know, something like Marcus Aurelius is a form of religious life. Yeah, I'm not sure if uh, we'll be able to come up with a satisfactory definition. So, uh, talking about, like, the merits of religion and what it's going to look like in the future, obviously it says something about human nature, religion. Would you be willing to, like, attempt a definition of religion itself? And, I because, because, uh, <laughs> it's uh, a fool's I, errand. <laughs> Because, I mean, when I took, I, I took one philosophy of religion course in college, because uh, philosophy was actually my minor, and uh, a huge portion of that class was spent talking about just just simply how to define religion. So it's uh, a huge question. Um, so you're absolutely right. So it's, that is a question in and of itself in the philosophy of religion, is how do we define a religion? What constitutes something being a religion because it's like trying to define what a game is. You mm -hmm. know, uh, shuffleboard has absolutely nothing to do with football, yet they're both games. Well, things like Jainism are entirely different from something like a robust fundamentalist Christianity. So how do we, how do we define something that has such a broad scope? And the, the answer that I've become partial to has um, come from the work of J.L. Schellenberg, who puts forward the, he pioneered the hiddenness argument. But he says that a religion must meet at least three criteria. Three, you know, these might not be sufficient conditions for a um, religion, but they certainly seem like necessary conditions. And the first is that whatever these religious beliefs are, they're the deepest metaphysical fact about reality. So to give an example, um, Taoism thinks of the ultimate metaphysical fact as the Tao, the the mm -hmm. thing that you can't speak about, but it's you know it's in every it's part of everyday life. Uh, uh, it's what's equivalent to the Force in Star mm -hmm. Wars. That's what that's modeled off of. So that would be that there would be nothing greater than the Tao in Christianity. There'd be nothing greater than God. So it's the deepest metaphysical fact. Um, the second condition is that it's of greatest axiological value to us. So axiological meaning value. So there would be nothing more important than it. So if, if say take for example if Christianity was true, we would have an infinite relationship with a perfectly loving being for all of eternity that would constantly grow ever deeper. There'd be nothing more valuable than that. It would encompass the greatest value in our lives. And then the third prong is that we've got to have some sort of relationship to this idea. Again, like in Taoism, it's the Tao and effortless flowing through life or in Christianity, 
It's the relation, personal relationship that you have with Jesus Christ. Um, it can't just be some abstract concept thing that we don't interact with in everyday life. So really, we shouldn't be thinking of religions as sets of beliefs, but rather forms of life, ways of living, and it, having that aspect in it. And so I think those three, for, for some idea or some form of life to count as religious, I think it has to, to meet those three criteria at least. Yeah, uh, that makes sense. And uh, that being the case, I'm guessing that religion uh, within the rubric of that definition isn't going to go away uh, probably ever. And so there's uh, always going to be something to bump up against there. I think that's and... right. I think we'll always look for a, a spiritual element. And I think there's truths to be found in those spiritual kind of questions. Yeah, at the very least, what it says about us as creatures who uh, have things like existential angst and uh, the desire to impose order on chaos and that kind of thing. Exactly. I think that's right. I don't, there are certainly very narrow conceptions of religion that will die out in time. But that, we know that very likely is going to happen. But to see our entire concept of religion or religious belief fall away, I don't, I don't see that happening. It seems like it's a pretty integral, integral part of the human experience. And that's true, I think, even of atheists. Even atheists will, you know, watch an episode of the cosmos and listen to Carl Sagan and experience, you know, feelings of awe and wonder and reverence to the cosmos. I think, you know, there's elements of spirituality in that in ways that we could properly call it religious. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I think that Ben's right. Like, Clearly, some particular expressions of of uh, religiousness um, are on their way out. That is that's as clear as I mean. There's writing on the wall there with all the statistics that we've been gathering over the last you know what Pew's been doing for the past fifteen years or so. Um, there's there's a clear trend there. You know whether or not that continues. You know who knows. But but it's not at all implausible that 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 uh, particular organized forms of religion uh, are on their way out in a clear clear way um but the notion uh as as i you know i'm agreeing with ben here the notion that our religious concepts generally are on their way out that's a that's that's an an absolute fantasy um we are <laughs> these bizarre balls of consciousness we are orphans of the cosmos and um we have restless uh, brains, and we need to make sense of things. Um, we need to identify with something bigger than ourselves in a kind of way to symbolically survive our death. Um, we have uh, a tendency to overattribute agency. The brain is an agency slut, essentially. Um, <laughs> We're very promiscuous when it comes to our attribution of agency. Um, and, and, you know, barring some fundamental change to human brains, some large, you know, punctuated, uh, evolutionary change in, in human brains, uh, these concepts are going to be with us for a very long time. And that's not something that we need to, you know, that's not something that we should shame people for. It's not something that we should, uh, have a, a, kind of allergic reaction to it's something that deserves our attention it's something that you know if you're not going to believe it that's that's fine that you know i i don't um but i think it's something to pay attention to 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 investigate and to see if if there is something that that speaks to you there uh both of you came from a background of religious upbringing as did i and now as atheists you continue to engage with theists especially as we've been saying within the Christian tradition. Now, the philosophical issues surrounding the nature of deconversion itself is something I really want to get into, but uh, before getting into that, would you be willing to share a few details about your own respective deconversions from religion to atheism? Um, so I grew up in the Deep South in a conservative Quaker tradition. And so we, the, the tradition I grew up in did not agree with the emphasis of church itself, like an establishment, so they went to people's houses for Bible studies. And so that was our way of worshiping every week. 
And because of that setup, there wasn't a whole lot of direction. So everyone hmm. was their own theologian. My own theology growing up was tough to piece together because of those reasons. And so I went to college um, and got a degree in engineering. And when I got out, I started, you know, putting my life together. And I was like, I've got to get a, I've got to get a career started. I've got to get married. I've got to, you know, do all this other stuff. And so I, I just started asking myself, where does religion fit in for me? And that began my journey into apologetics and philosophy of religion, trying to find answers. And just over an amount of time, um, I just started shaving off more and more religious beliefs until one day I, I kind of looked at myself and was like, I, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in this personal being. And it was kind of a, it was an existential shattering of my worldview. And so then, you know, while I was standing on the ashes of that, I was like, okay, what do I do now? And that's when I turned to philosophy and just became, just immersed myself in what I call the great debate, you know, building a worldview and just trying to follow arguments wherever they lead. I just kind of committed myself. I was like, okay, I'm not committed to this theistic being, so I'll commit myself to a life of questioning. And, you know, 10 years later, here I am, um, <laughs> uh, the co-host of a philosophy of religion podcast. So... <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting. I've I've heard that experience a lot uh, talking to people who've deconverted that it's there's not like a single moment where like there's not a demarcation of you were a Christian or uh some kind of theist and then all of a sudden you're an atheist. Um there's not like a moment. It's like a realization that mm -hmm. oh, I I just realized I'm an atheist. Yeah, and so it's definitely a long process. There was no, like, one event in my life that was like, you know, that event happened, and I was like, I'm an atheist now. But I do <laughs> remember struggling a lot with apologetic arguments, because I just wasn't very satisfied with them. And I do remember stumbling across J.L. Schellenberg's hiddenness art, a video of him presenting it, and just closing my laptop in frustration, going, I can't deal with the problem of evil. How in the hell am I going to deal with this problem, too? <laughs> and it wasn't very long after that before I realized, I was like, oh, um, I'm an atheist, and I don't have to deal with those arguments. So <laughs> there was kind of, I do remember that moment of just, of this culminating of frustration, and then after that wave of frustration leaving me going, okay, I, this is this is what I believe. Clearly now. Yeah, uh, with regard to my uh, my story, um, I was raised a little Catholic baby, and then uh, my kind of early teens, we switched to a kind of non-denominational, which is really just a, a, a word that um, Reformed churches use <laughs> to yeah, sound yeah. very inclusive. Um, mm -hmm. And so I started to attend there, and this was a, a church uh, where the um, where my uh, my pastor was a relatively young guy, seemed pretty hip. He would tell jokes from on stage. Uh, there was a guitar, a drum, uh, or a, a drum set. Um, and it was much more engaging for me at that age. And so this was the first time I actually started to open my ears to what was being said uh, and to start to take very seriously what was being said. And as a result, I got actually really quite into it. Uh, I started to lead worship at the uh, at some of the teen gatherings and things. Um, I got very much into into the the programming of the church and I, I into my, my personal uh, devotional time. But there was a point at which uh, I think it was just thinking about the stories of the Old Testament in particular and thinking about my lack of perceived response when it came to my prayer life i it, i became increasing it felt increasingly like i was just on my knees talking to myself and that uh that shook me after a while it was something i ignored for for a while um but my general transition there was not an intellectual one it was a kind of shift a kind of more uh, an increasing awareness of 
my uh, impressions of these ideas. So all these stories in the Old Testament, I kind of, I was increasingly skeptical that these were things that happened to real people like you and me who, you know, had, you know, had to visit the bathroom, you know, every few hours <laughs> in their real life, right? Like these were people that were, that would get bruises. Like these were real mortal human beings that these stories were happened to. That was what I was being sold. And I was increasingly unwilling to take the bargain. Um, and yeah, my lack of perceived response in prayer life, those two things in conjunction really kind of killed it for me. And it didn't, they didn't go easy. I, I held on very much for emotional reasons. I, it was a huge panic. Losing that, that aspect of my life was to lose every person who I counted as a friend at that time. Um, and so it was very much an emotional attempt at saving whatever I could, uh, but eventually I, I, I failed in being a good Christian soldier. So, <laughs> so uh, what you're saying is that you didn't become an atheist just because you want to sin all the time? No, no, I was, uh, <laughs> I was actually just, I was, it was weird because as I'm losing my belief, I'm starting to think of myself as a bad person. I'm starting to think, oh, people who don't believe, you know, these, I've always associated that with sinfulness, right? So as I'm, <laughs> as I'm losing my belief against my will, I'm the essentially the universe is robbing me is like taking this set of beliefs from me and I want them back but I can't have them back and I'm starting to feel like I'm starting to feel like the piece of shit like a moral degenerate simply because I can't retain these beliefs and that is that's a very difficult experience to go through and it's not uncommon I remember using the word atheist as an insult in middle school Mm -hmm. and so that was, you know, looking back on it now, that was my attitude towards someone who didn't believe in the existence of God. That was just a bad thing. And it was viewed as a irony. pejorative. I grew up in a uh, fundamentalist Baptist uh, congregation, and uh, atheism was just never discussed. It was never acknowledged, or very rarely. And... uh I think that's because I have my own theories about it, but whenever atheism was brought up, it was always in the context of, like, the horrors of the 20th century and Stalinism and the rise of dictators and what a world without God looks like. But other than that, it wasn't really addressed because the people uh, in my church who preached and taught Sunday school classes didn't really want to acknowledge that there are people who do not believe in God. Um, they spent a lot of their energy going after heresy within uh, faith traditions and viewing that as the real threat. Yeah, uh, I certainly agree with that. Uh, one of the things that really frustrated me when I first started my deconversion, I, I guess we'll call it, is there was... These groups, there was, there was these two sides. It was, you know, the, the theists on one side and the atheists on one side. And it was very common in the theistic camp to find just the experience that you described. Like, it just wasn't discussed. The questions weren't asked. It was kind of glossed over. And it was almost like it was insulating itself from something that would count against it. They didn't want to... uh put forth atheism as an option like they didn't they didn't think of it as an option and they didn't want the congregation to think of it as an option that to was me it seemed they were threatened by questions whereas if on the other side that all these atheists were you know saying that they were free thinkers and that they welcomed the questions and that having this questioning attitude and this skeptical attitude was a good thing so that all these questions that I was that I was wrestling with and feeling insecure about not being able to answer within my own tradition, the atheists were saying, look, those are good questions. And your inability to answer those questions should tell you something. That was a huge, and, you know, obviously there were, there were other factors. I, I wasn't having religious experiences. I was, I was earnestly seeking, trying to come into the fold. And it was just silent. Uh, and bad things were happening. The problem of evil. Every theist, I think, struggles with it. And so, you know, if there is this perfectly loving God, why is there just so much tragedy in the world? And so, 
it just made this perfect storm of religious belief eroding-ness that I, I was never able to recover from. Yeah, the beginning of the end for me was uh, when I was uh, 17 years old, or around that age, and uh, um, I was I grew up in a homeschooled family, so all my uh, school curriculum was very uh, selective, and uh, my parents uh, uh, invested in like a, a philosophy course for high school age kids. Uh, within uh, the homeschool community, because there was a whole community that we uh, engaged with. There's a whole network of homeschool families that we socialized with. And within that, there was a, a pretty popular curriculum among that community that taught about philosophy through the lens of Christianity and talked about uh, the history of philosophy and kind of the history of ideas within a Christian framework. And I remember reading a book by uh, James Sire. I'm not sure if you two are familiar with that author. He's a, a, a Christian philosopher who wrote uh, The Universe Next Door, which is basically just a, a book introducing all the major worldviews uh, throughout history. And that was where I really uh, started coming up against the idea and realization that there are a multitude of different ways of viewing the world. There was a chapter in there on naturalism, which is how atheism was couched, and uh, chapters on various Eastern religions and uh, various philosophical traditions like existentialism and nihilism. And that, was, that wasn't the end for me, for my faith, but it was the beginning of the end, because uh, I realized that if I'm going to believe what I was raised to believe, I need to address as many of these different worldviews as possible to make sure I'm right. So, uh, with all our kind of backgrounds thrown in there, do you think deconversion itself is a mostly rational, psychological process for most people, or a mostly emotional one? I know Justin has addressed this uh, in a few posts, and maybe uh, received some flack for it, I'm not sure. Yeah, I think it's mostly uh, non-rational. Um, I mean, th that's certainly true for myself, but I also find that to be the case when most people tell me their their stories uh, of leaving religion or of adopting religion, I think. Uh, they're usually for non-rational reasons. Um, so I'll, I'll give a, a couple of reasons that I, that I, I get often. Uh, one of them being um, just that religion is judgmental, right? They, they see it as a very judgmental set of ideas. And, you know, perhaps that's true. It, it, <laughs> certainly a case could be argued. Um, but of course that has nothing to do with whether or not, whether or not it is true, right? Whether or not the religious belief system itself is true, right? It could be a very bigoted <laughs> worldview, but still be true about the world, right? That's, that's a possibility that needs to be entertained. It could be a bunch of other things. But the, the point is that like most of the time when I'm, when I'm hearing reports about deconversions, these are for non-rational reasons. That should not be associated with my like criticizing of of these experiences. I think that experiences are experiences, and I don't think that they can be invalid in the, in any real sense. The point being that when you start to very cleanly identify as something else, as something with a different set of beliefs, usually uh, it's the case that you find that shift happening to you, and then you go about researching and justifying that new worldview that you have right mm. um so you know like oh you you know you fall away from religion uh for whatever reason um but now like now you identify as an atheist so let's go to the library and get some books on atheism and, and try to you know try to find the language to be able to articulate those ideas uh to other people to try and you know explain why it is that you have these beliefs and maybe you maybe you by yourself have have come to some of the general uh, justifications of it, but you typically would want to read something that's a bit more articulate for your kind of, uh, you know, like you're brand new to these ideas. And so you want to read someone who's, who's been kind of marinating in them, them for a while to give you the, the tools to be able to articulate your, your view. So I take a little bit different approach because I, I like your distinction between rational and psychological explanation. Um, because we can 
explain why certain beliefs are justified or rational. You know, do we have good reasons for having them? And then we can talk about what actually motivates people to change their mind. And so that would be in the psychological explanation. And so I think those psycho some of those psychological explanations are more rational than others. So mm -hmm. someone who has an experience of coming to theistic belief may have done so more rationally than an atheist who has lost their belief, and that can be vice versa. That, absolutely, absolutely. That, that, that's dependent on the case. And so if I had to, to nail down a psychological factor, I was going to say, you know, what really gets people to either lose faith or to gain faith, I would, I, I would I always come back to religious experience. Um, one of the questions as a philosopher I constantly pose to myself, as an atheist, what evidence could be brought to the table that would, in principle, change my mind? And I always come back to a religious experience. In order to have cogent, veridical religious experience that I just really believe, I was like, look, there's no other way I could believe that this was anything else. That's what would change my mind. It would be, I would be very strange atheist who says that they were having religious experiences, but were still an atheist. Conversely, it would be, I think it's religious experiences that cause people to become theists. And so if someone was a theist and wasn't having any, any religious experiences uh, or you know, living that sort of form of life, I would find that strange. Now, I'm not saying that those people don't exist. I'm just, to me, it seems strange. Um, people who are really immersed in a theistic worldview, I think, would find it very difficult to leave that because they have a sense of community, they have these religious experiences, and pulling out of that web is you're just too tangled in it. Now, are these religious experiences or lack of religious experiences rational? Are they good reasons for adopting theism um, or atheism? Um, that's up for debate. Uh, Justin, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Justin, would, would consider a lot of these religious experiential components non-rational considerations. That these are considerations that would give us reasons for or against. Uh, I don't know. It's complicated. <laughs> it's complicated. Exactly. So, That's what I'm saying. Like, this is, so, this is philosophy of religion is trying to yeah, flesh out these it's, difficult questions. So there are a number of, of different factors that, that go into play, right? So, yeah, I mean, you can point to the classic things that would seem like clear defeaters for religious experience, like the fact that the, the content of them tend to be, um, culturally relative, right? So, uh, you know, you, you don't really have your person brought up in like, you know, a, a strict evangelical community in like in Alabama. You don't really have them having religious experiences of like the the Tao or something, right? Like you don't you don't get that, or you know, of 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 Muhammad or you know some other some you know other messenger of some other religion tradition, right? Um, so that seems like that should point against the reliability of these things. And I also think, but it gets complicated because I think that people, generally speaking, I'm very sympathetic to the idea that if something seems like something, uh, then you are rational to believe it unless you have really good reasons to think it not be the case. So, so a great, I think a perfect scene from a movie to, to talk about the complexities of religious experience is to think about that scene in contact where Jodie Foster's character, she's, you know, she's communicating with these, with these aliens or whatever. And she goes into this big orb and she's supposed to be transported into this, this alien world. Right. And from everyone around this, uh, at the space station, everyone around just, just hanging out, watching her go into this, um, this pod, uh, she's only in it for like a split second. Um, but from her, pers her perspective, she's experiencing like this entire thing that's perfectly consistent with her background knowledge up to that point where she goes and like visits this other world. And it's like, okay, well, when she gets, when she finally gets back, is she irrational to believe that she genuinely had those experiences and that those experiences were not only had genuinely, but were also veridical? Um, 
I don't know that there's an obvious answer to that. And I'm skeptical of people who think that they have an obvious answer to that. I don't know that Jodie Foster's character would necessarily be guilty of any kind of epistemic sin for defending (laughs) the fact that she genuinely went to another place. And even though, you know, obviously everyone on the ground on Earth there perceived it as a split second thing, obviously, you know, time is a weird thing. It's not inconceivable, you know, that, you know, if you could manipulate all this, you know, I don't know, this, this science fiction technology, obviously it, it throws a wrench in this issue. But the point, <laughs> yeah. the point being that, like, I don't think that her character is irrational for genuinely believing that she had that experience. And I think the same goes for religious experience. Now it might be misinterpreted. For sure, right? Like that's 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 always the case. But I don't think there's a clean and broad rule about religious experience that can allow us to dismiss them all out of hand. And that's probably weird to hear an atheist say. But I- well, um, my position has always been it makes no sense to, uh, and there's no justification for like uh, denying that somebody had a religious experience who is relating it and talking sure. about it. Uh, sure. But there's also, at the same time, valid criticisms of the argument from personal revelation uh, in terms of the experience of the person that the experiencer is trying to convince. Arguments from personal revelation don't impact me or impress me that much, even yeah. though I have no reason, even though I have no reason to doubt them and doubt their story or their experience. Absolutely. Yeah. I don't, yeah, I could never be convinced by someone telling me a story of their personal revelation, right? That I can totally agree with you. Um, because I'm not the person who experienced it, right? Like, so there is a pride, there is a sense in which, you know, our experiences are private, right? And, what I mean, it's perfectly it's perfectly rational for us to say, uh, you know, Gary is rational in believing X, but John is not, even though they both intellectually have the same facts, but yet experientially they have access to different facts, right? So that is a distinction that's important, and uh, which also complicates all these issues. So, uh, yeah, like I said, I I am very skeptical of broad rules or or uh you know broad principles about how to treat religious experience so one of the things that makes it such a thorny issue is that religious experience um like justin was saying is is a first person inner experience that doesn't have third person access like a scientific experiment would so it's not something we can't share one another's religious experience in a neutral third person place so as philosophers, what we have to do is we have to put ourselves in the position, or, or imagine ourselves in the position of, of a theist, having a wide range of experiences and how we would react to it. So to give a philosophical example, uh, at the turn of the 20th century, a famous philosopher named G.E. Moore was trying to respond to arguments for skepticism, you know, saying that they, you know, we couldn't rely on our memory and there was no external world, and just all these real skeptical arguments. And his argument was like, look, I know I have hands, and I know the sun is in the sky. So if any argument says that I don't have hands or that the sun isn't in the sky, something's wrong with that argument, not my experiences. Mm -hmm. So I'm imagining imagining myself as a theist having these strong, powerful, cogent religious experiences you know, we can say, well, we, we have all these considerations that would make you doubt or, you know, change whether or not you believe the, the, these experiences you have in your veridical. Well, they could just as easily say, well, no, look, my experience, and in fact, they do, Plantica has a similar route of doing the same, no, my experience is first and foremost. Mm-hmm. If something says that that experience of, say, the, the Holy Ghost, um, if, if some argument was to be brought forward to say that this undercut that belief, there must be something wrong with that argument. In the same way, there must be something wrong with the argument that says I don't have hands or that the sun is in the sky. And so it's really when you when you when you, when you see it like that, it's, it becomes this huge daunting problem. How do you how do you tackle something like that? Yeah, yeah, that's uh, a lot of uh, food for thought right there. <laughs> Well, uh, we're already running up on an hour, which uh, I'm kind of 
relieved about because I didn't know if I'd be able to keep a, a, an interesting conversation going by myself for a whole hour or not. Because I'm used to having co-hosts to help me along with the discussion. Uh, in kind of wrapping up, what are your favorites for both of you? What is your favorite subject to discuss or debate within philosophy of religion? And uh, do you have any uh, like interesting stories about some of those favorite debates you've had? Obviously, I said earlier one of my favorite questions. And hopefully, one of the things that I hope to use real theology to accomplish is to explore questions of after we've re rejected the existence of God, where do we go from there? So uh, I'd already went over those, but another one that I'm particularly fond of discussing is the relationship of ethics to contemporary philosophy of religion. So there's a lot of work already being done, and even in popular culture, about science and contemporary religious ideas. But ethics is sometimes overlooked, um, and, which is surprising because there's arguments on both sides of the aisle that require appealing to ethical claims. Um, there's argument arguments from evil on the atheistic side, and there's moral arguments or arguments for moral agency on the theistic side. Since I'm so interested in moral philosophy and ethics, I've found a lot of interesting room to dialogue with theists on these topics, you know, from the moral argument to problems of evil. Well, yeah, hopefully uh, shows like The Good Place will kind of popularize uh, moral philosophy. I'm and... rooting for it. Oh, I love that show. <laughs> yeah. Just as uh, Westworld is doing for philosophy of mind, am I right? Exactly. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yes. Yep. Um, I guess if I'm to pick one of my favorite subjects, I guess it's a subject that I can't let go of. Um, it's this this argument that I've kind of worked on and I've come up with a couple of different variations over the last about five or six years. Um, and it has something to do with, um, you know, the, the, the problem of evil, it, it has a underlying assumption. It's that, that God, if he existed, would create a world and that this world would be something that is, you know, has finite creatures, uh, of which experience, only good things and never suffer or perhaps suffer less than they do in our world right that's a kind of assumption that 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 holds sway both among theists and atheists and they they will answer that dilemma in different ways but uh one thing that i've been kind of uh unable to let go of is is just kind of dropping that whole thing uh and actually making a case for the notion that if a god did exist of the traditional definition that uh, he would either create nothing or create something fundamentally different than finite creatures existing in a in a finite universe, where uh, you know I I think that they would be rather um, I think a case could be made that if a god did exist again he would either create nothing or he would create clones of himself essentially um, creatures that are perfect in every way and engage and in, in in meaningful and deep relationship with each other in perpetual perfect bliss and that that is what we should is what should be seen as the new standard of a problem of evil so that anything not like that should be a problem for the existence of god but of course that that means we don't have to really identify particularly nasty things in our world we just have to identify that our world exists uh and it exists with a bunch of creatures who are not omnipotent who are ignorant and who are far from moral perfection and just the fact that we exist should be i think a problem an evidential problem um that's a that's like a collection of ideas that i'm currently working on and and i've <laughs> like i said I, there's been different versions of of that kind of issue i've been kind of playing with but um uh, I think there's something promising there. Um, mm -hmm. I'm sure all my theistic friends would disagree, but. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've thought about that kind of thing too. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, the way I've thought about this, not quite in terms of how you've put it, cause it sounds pretty original to you for the most part or the way you framed it. But, uh, I've thought about similar things like, uh, 
the way the uh, fine tuning argument is presented mm -hmm. seems to me like if there's a perfect, omnipotent, all knowing God who created everything, by definition, he wouldn't need to fine tune anything. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Um, because no matter how the universe would turn out, he could, through the power of perpetual miracles, make it the case that there's always the kind of creatures that he wants, right? He's the author of the laws. He doesn't need to be working within them necessarily. So Why I think that's God a good point. Why does care about the strong or weak nuclear force? That's like the the, the physics uh, version of like the uh, Euthyphro dilemma. Yeah. It, it yeah, there are some it, parallels yeah. for sure. Um, but I think, well, I'll 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 save that for another time. I, I could talk about those sorts of arguments for another. Hour. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. So. Um. Continuing to wrap up, what books or other resources do you recommend for a people interested in introducing themselves to philosophy of religion for the first time, or to going into like deep dives within particular subjects? So, if if what in philosophy of religion you are interested in is uh, the God debate, then I have four books that I think are are pretty great. Uh, in conjunction with dealing with that. It gives you a, a broad treatment, what I think is a pretty sophisticated treatment of the issues. Uh, and these books are uh, Theism and Explanation by a philosopher by the name of Gregory Dawes, uh, Wisdom to Doubt by J.L. Schellenberg, who's already been mentioned, uh, the, the Problem of Animal Pain by Trent Doherty, and a book just called The Existence of God by a philosopher, uh, an Oxford philosopher, Richard Swinburne. I think that those four books, there's two atheist books there, there's two theist books there. Um, I think that those are good because they both deal with the classical problems, but they also have new and valuable insights uh, that I think are largely uh, not represented in the contemporary discussion. On, the, on a more popular level, I think that most of the popular conversation that goes on appears to be mostly dealing with classical arguments and very little of it deals with more contemporary work. And I think that these four books constitute some some good contemporary progress on these issues. So for me, I highly recommend uh, Hume's Dialogues Concerning Natural Religion. I think all contemporary the philosophy of religion is really just a, a continuation of that dialogue. This is what throwing shade is called. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, it's, um, I, I think it's, it, is, it, it marked a really, really important point in the philosophy of religion and what philosophy of religion is now. And though it can be a little daunting because of the way it's written. I mean, it's Hume, so it's written in, like, the 1700s. Um, you can get spark notes for it pretty easily. and Just familiarize yourself just with that dialogue. I think that's really important. Um, mm, yeah. As far as books go, I second Justin on Richard Swinburne's The Existence of God for Theists. I also recommend for Theists Alvin Plantinga's Warranted Christian Belief. I think that was a big work on the theist side and on the atheist side, I recommend J.L. Mackey's The Miracle of Theism. I think that's one of the definitive works for atheists. Mm -hmm. that's, one of, that's one of my favorites. Yes. Um, I think that's very, very substantive. Very good. Very technical. So it can be, it's one of those ones that you have to spend some time with. Justin Mitchin, The Wisdom to Doubt um, by J.L. Schellenberg. I, I obviously recommend that book, but it's part of a trilogy. It's the book two of a trilogy. I recommend the whole trilogy. Um, okay. The first one being, uh, he's called a prolegoma to philosophy of religion, and so that's basically where he sets the groundwork for philosophy of religion. And I thought that's where I got my concept for religion that I presented earlier was from that book. And so I thought okay. that would be very, very helpful. I also recommend debates, uh, academic debates on YouTube. Those are great resources for people who want to give me these, these questions. Not Christopher Hitchens, you know, Richard Dawkins type debates where they're just insulting theists the whole time, or, mm. you know, nearly all the time, but people like we had Michael Tooley debated William and Craig, um, Paul Draper debate, debated him as well. Those are very good debates to watch. 
And I'm a huge fan of Alan Watts. So, for people who are non-theists who want to look into the philosophy of religion, I highly recommend Alan Watts for all our lectures. Mm-hmm. And can I just say that I think it's pretty awesome that contemporary philosophers are still using words like prolegomena in their book titles. <laughs> yes. And uh, uh, and on that note, I'd also like to shout out uh, the book that Justin wrote with Randall Rouser, an atheist and a Christian walk into a bar talking about God, the universe, and everything from uh, Prometheus books. I'll go ahead and uh, recommend that as well. Oh, that that's and all right I'll too, put... I suppose. That's a that's a decent book. <laughs> you saved us the trouble of the shameless plug. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll have uh, I'll have links in the show notes to uh, where people can find your show and your book, Justin, and uh, some of the stuff that you've mentioned as well. So uh, on that note, thank you for taking time out of your day to talk to me on this very first episode. Thank you so much for having. Hey, it was my pleasure. Thanks a lot. Thank you for listening to A Leap of Doubt. If you liked what you heard, please consider leaving a review on iTunes. If you want to get involved in the kinds of discussions this show is meant to encourage, you can find a discussion group on Facebook at facebook.com slash groups slash A-L-O-P discussion. You can follow me and get in touch with me on Twitter, where my username is at TheNatheist. Feedback and criticisms are always welcome. The opening clip is an excerpt from the audiobook God is Not Great by Christopher Hitchens, courtesy of Hachette Audio. Text copyright 2007 by Christopher Hitchens. Audio production copyright 2007, Hachette Audio. Used with permission. The music is Jade by Esther Nicholson and is used under license.